Uh, so the first thing I wanted to go through is okay. So let's let's do this. So we we so right now it's looking pretty positive in a sense that we've got two weeks, and if all goes well, that system setup it will be like one day possibly to connect it all up. And if we're really fast, well, probably like one day to connect it up, and second day to get all the measurement infrastructure going right because there's going to be um, on that side like okay so once we have everything plugged in as far as getting the data collection set up I mean are you also going to have that pretty much set up that it's just okay we just install and that's it and you basically now wait for the data points to come to the to the right. SD cards yeah. or is there going to be like some testing and uh, there, there shouldn't be uh, too much uh, after it's installed there should be much work involved I, I envision uh, getting it set up, uh, letting it sit for maybe at first, let it sit for an hour, so mm -hmm. get six samples, take the SD card out, make sure all the data looks fine, none of the channels are dead. Okay. Spend a couple hours debugging that. Then after afterwards, we'll just let it sit for a few days and see what we can get from it. Yeah. As far as the level of documentation that you have, like the actual operating procedure for installation and operation of this system, do you were you going to prepare any of that? or? Yeah, yeah. So that that's all going to be uh, that's all going to be wiki base. I have to be I, I have to be careful not to self plagiarize. Um, but yeah, there will be documentation that I can put on the Appropedia and on OSC's wiki. Okay, you are going to set some time for that um, before coming out here. Though that's one of your tasks. Yep. Is uh, Dr. Pierce? interested in that as in okay he's going to publish the paper and also like unroll the installation instructions at the same time is that kind of how you're thinking or yeah I, yeah i think i think that's what we're planning to do that's good i mean if you have all of that then yeah it should take one day the worst thing i can say is that uh we need to spend the, the second day debugging everything because things are just not working like we think so yeah so that sounds good which means that we have uh did he give you a so basically two weeks, like arrive that Monday and leave the Monday or so, or Sunday, two weeks from then? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he doesn't really have a strict timeline. Okay. And you're and flexible I mean, on, so you'd be driving out or? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be driving. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm flexible when I have to come back in my... Uh, okay. So assuming we have two weeks and you're flexible on that Monday, because we were like actually looking at visiting some friends that weekend, so... Um, You'd be okay arriving like in the afternoon on Monday. Uh, well, I so if I left on Monday, I'd probably leave at six, and I wouldn't get there till six or seven p.m. Yeah, and that'll be okay for you. Yeah, yeah, we should be fine. Okay, yeah. So that's so let's keep the tentative date, which was the eighteenth, currently, right? That was the Monday, the eighteenth. Yep. yep that yeah, so be... arrive Monday around seven or eight o'clock, eight p.m. Yep. Uh, June. That actually makes it Monday the nineteenth. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, I can leave on Sunday. It's not that big of a deal. Okay. Yeah, cause I, I'm. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can coordinate that in more detail. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let's talk about. Well, here's one thing, you know, around just just on timing issues, we were going to run a, a 3D printer build after, pretty much like after you're done here, but let's, let's if we look at the calendar dates, um, do you think that, what, what do we expect the workflow to be like? Okay, so there's a bunch of build time. Um, well, how do you want to so, do that? Do you want me to work with you? Do you, I mean, how, how, how are we going to be working on that? So we definitely do a lot of work and prep in terms of the design, right? So that's something like before you come, you know, like when you come, we should not be doing any design work. That all needs to be done beforehand, right? So then, right? Is that... Yeah. How are you picturing it? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, the only thing is that that design is probably more going to have to be weighted on you guys. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can. We can do that. We can uh, do the full CAD. We can do like the critical BOM stuff. Uh, you can, 
you can can you help yeah. on some of the critical BOM stuff like if we go with the yep yeah, yep yeah, like picking up screws. like a spindle um, yeah. stuff like that yes can, yeah that. but otherwise the mechanical we plan on using our exact same system the only decision fork we'd need to make is whether the 5 16 rods are big enough and yeah. do you think that they will do or we have to go a little bit uh, larger 5 16 rods uh, that's a little small I would, I would, assume, I would assume it'd be fun let me, let me measure how big the rods are on my system yeah Just a second, it's just right yeah. on my desk. Uh, yeah, that would be good. So you're saying you're saying for the bearing rods? Yeah. Yeah, because that's the stiffness. I mean, if we're doing like a five by five inch thing, they're gonna be pretty short, so I think we can probably even just use those as they are. Just use the five sixteenths. So Okay, half inch. So maybe we do, maybe we do just need to go to the half inch. And what's the what's the working size on your mill? Uh, I think it's. Uh, I that. Yeah, it'd definitely be a good idea to go to that, so we can. About, it's it's eight by eight by three. Eight by eight by three. Three in height. Yes. Okay, so eight half inch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't want to take a risk on, on that being a trouble spot, so let's just do that. And I think for the first machine that we do, I mean, we should we should go probably, you want to go for like 5x5? Five five yeah. Working area? Yeah, and you really, uh, so, you just need enough travel such that you can lift the spindle up, pull out. So, uh, so let me see. Most, most tools... The shank in them is an inch. So let me see. Yeah, most 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 tools. The shank is an inch. Tools sticks out like half inch. So you you need at least an inch and a half travel uh, under z-axis. Mm-hmm. Okay. And let's talk about the feature sizes. Yeah, so we'll, we'll probably plan on it. We'll just enlarge our things to one half inch. That should be fine. Um, just before we go further, how much time do you have to to do any of this design work? Is uh, Are you going to be really busy with the finalizing all this on the power meter? Or are you going to have some time for this, some um, design time? I, I, I could probably make some time... Uh, so what are you looking for? You're just looking for uh, the main thing I'm looking for is the calculations and calling up. We we have to call up the belt places and get a very solid answer. So you know, a few hours on the phone with the with the belt guys to make sure that what we're doing, we know what we're getting into, and we can calculate this is what we can get as a theoretical limit, and then we see if we can do it in practice. Because if the theoretical limit is not there. Uh, we need to know that. I mean, we don't want. We're, we're not just taking data. We're like proving, verifying performance that we've calculated. Yeah. So, uh, the design work. I mean, I can. I can definitely do that. Uh, would you have time to actually talk to the belt guys and and look into the calculations, backlash, and all of that? Uh, probably can. I, okay. I don't know uh, because I'm not too familiar with. That's why it might be better for you to okay. get the information just because you know what you're working with. Like yeah. Your printer. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. We could we could make that happen. That's not that's not bad. It's it's an it's an hour conversation or so. Um, just make sure we know what we're doing and we know what the state of art in belting is. You know, because uh, yeah. there might be some belts we don't even know of that have this performance that's unheard of. And I'm sure there. Yeah. You know, there's probably new developments in that area just like with anything right so uh yeah we can look at that okay okay but um 
definitely want to put that into our budget. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely consistent with the work we want to do because uh, we're going to be scaling up these machines to larger, heavy, heavier duty CNC machines. So we really need to understand those belts and things. So, uh, and then we can make the decision because, so, okay, so next, next, um, next item. So feature size requirements. So we'll go into the document. Uh, let's discuss this. So, so that I'm fully equipped to discuss that um, when I do talk on the phone. So feature size, you're in the doc? Yeah, I'm watching. So in the current one you have on your mill, what's what's the current capacity? Like what's the spec for the path sizes? For, uh, all right. So uh, the minimum I can cut is point one millimeter uh so that's like zero point one millimeter wide yes that's that's the size of the cut that i make with my end mill um so let me i should fit that i use uh, and so i make my traces uh, I don't make them more than one. Wait, hold up. Uh, hold up. I gotta, I gotta look. It just, it just uh, blew my mind. Uh, my trace. I'm trying to think of my trace width. Mm-hmm. So my trace, my trace width, my minimum is 0.5 millimeters. So half, half a millimeter is the thinnest I'll go for a trace. And so oh, can you give me a, can you give me editing privileges? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah. 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 Okay, check now. Okay, I think I'm doing good. Okay. Right, so trace width minimum is 0.5 millimeters. Okay, that's, cool. That's, can you so put a that's link? What I use to do the, uh, can you, what's like, uh, you can hyperlink that. Can you yeah, put a yeah, link yeah. to that? Yeah. In the doc? Okay. Put the blue to know that it's it's a link. Okay. Um. So. Uh, let me let me do uh, my machine here because I want to figure out what the minimum. My backlash to be that was uh, that was still within reason. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, what what software do you want to use to drive this thing? Yeah, 
Uh, at best, I mean, can we just use uh, use Marlin and just use uh, two like G code that's just uh, just Marlin? Just put G code commands into Marlin since that's already used. Uh, probably. Does does wait? So what? I, I'm not familiar with Marlin. It's do you I, use I Franklin? It's G code flavor, uh, but is, is it? It's a software interface too. Yeah, it's got a the same 3D printing software. If you don't go up in Z, you just upload the one-dimensional file, and that's it. Yeah. So yes, it's it's all it's all. Uh, G1, yeah. G1 yeah, that's right. Basically. Thank you. Um, so, uh, what was I going to ask? Uh, well, if if there is backlash present in the system, and it's consistent. Then, uh, like the, the software that I use, you can just subtract your backlash, or you can add what you measure for your backlash to your movement whenever you change directions, and that can effectively remove any backlash issues. Um, it would be a good idea to build on your software. What software are you using? Uh, the software I'm using is not open source, unfortunately. Okay, so right no, now. that we wouldn't be able to use that though. Yeah. Um, have you used so, Marlin, uh, Franklin? I I'm I'm becoming familiar with Franklin. Yes. The problem with that is it's got no documentation, right? I mean, it's got the documentation, but I really need to see the code documentation. Does that exist? Yeah. Well, so so here's the thing: if 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 we make the system and we are measuring backlash and it's consistent, it wouldn't be that hard. To, uh, to make like a simple application that you put your G code in and it automatically corrects for your, uh, for your backlash before uh -huh. you put it in Marlin. Yeah, so we could have, for example, it senses, okay, whenever it... What's the logic whenever, there? Whenever your, delta, whenever your delta X or your delta Y becomes negative, then you know there's a, you know there's a change of direction and you just have to add your backlash onto it, whatever your backlash number is that you put in. And when it's when it's going at a slant, is that also easy to to correct? Uh, so you're saying when both both axes are going at the same time? Yeah, is that how it works? Because that's how it will be, right? It it moves. Yeah. Um. Well, th that that shouldn't backlash shouldn't be an issue when it comes to that. Uh, when it goes at an angle. It's and then it's so say it's moving at an angle and then reverses at the same angle. Can you detect that easily? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so your your change from the first point to the second point, you're gonna have a negative direction change, um, or relative to where you're currently at. Uh, That's... And so you can detect which axis is going to experience a backlash. Right. Is this within the scope to to get to this level? Because um, do you think we can get this post process or pre processor? working or do you think there's actually something out there that already does that i don't think there's something out there that already does that that's a utility that i would be interested in making just like on my own time not even research i can just slap it on my website yeah because uh, i love i love those simple little g-code utilities so uh that that's something i can make beforehand if it comes down to it okay because the worst case scenario is we just give it some manual g-codes with all the corrections manually put in yeah, I mean that, that's that's what I have to do on my system for my bed leveling, and we mm -hmm. might we might have to use my bed leveling. Well, we probably will have to use my bed leveling uh, utility for this system as well. So you you run it through the, the leveling uh, utility, and I might be able to just integrate the backlash utility right into it as well. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. That'll be good. Yep. Okay, so All let's right. let's just uh, go to that that calculation port. Which is uh, sure. pi times diameter. If we, if we use the current system as is with the steppers that we have, you got one revolution being about forty. You know, it's about <clears throat> about forty. Well, let's get a little more specific. Three point one times twelve. So we got like 38 millimeters per revolution. So then 
you divide that by 180 divided by 16. So one micro step is equals 38 divided by 180 divided by 16 equals. So what do we got as the theoretical limit there? Uh, that should be. Step size and per axis. Yeah. That's what this is. Yep. So that number, because we got to start there. That 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 works. Because if that doesn't work, uh, yeah, we got to go straight to the the rods. <clears throat> so sixteen. So we got point oh one millimeter. 0.01 millimeter. 0.013 millimeter. You know what? Screw it. Let me just. It, it's gonna take me like four seconds to uh, hook up, put on my dial indicator, okay. and see what my movement is that I measure uh, for for my mill. Yep. Uh, so, so, so you can keep talking to me. Uh, okay. Because it's, it's like right on my desk here. Okay. So we got 0 0.01 millimeter, and you said that the current minimum cut trace width is like 0.5 millimeter and then 0.1 millimeter wide for the cut well we've got a factor of 10 over that so so on first principles we're okay for the resolution so pending yeah. there would be no uh, like belt stretching because no backlash we can correct like can we correct uh, assuming that backlash we can correct to 1% which is what you said you've been getting uh, or assuming we get yeah. uh, corrected even to to 10%, well, whatever it is, I mean, we have to first measure the backlash. Um, but right here, we're saying, yes, it's possible to do it with GT2 belts. So we should pursue this, and the only thing that can get in our way is simply belt stretching, right? Yeah. So the summary here is, if we can get a, a quantity for a value, which I could never find on those spec sheets, what is the belt stretch value? For given forces then we can make it work we're within a factor of 10 adequate on the resolution we're, we're good on that so yeah I mean this should work man I mean this we could be making history here but but that means I mean we're gonna have to get everything right and you know every little error has to be uh, eliminated yeah. yeah so and uh, it, that may be difficult, and it would be great if we actually, you know, got together with somebody who tried this, uh, if they would talk to us. The Shapeoko people have done that. Uh, I think, I don't know, I mean, let's let's see what we do with our frame, but, but just by looking at all the other systems out there, they're not a space frame structure. A space frame is going to get you the highest level of stability for for the material you're using, so... So already we've got this advantage that, you know, like Shapeoko, uh, I don't know who else, but they just haven't done that. They're using the different systems. They, it's gant, like gantry system. Gantry right? style. Uh, gantry style, not the space frame style. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, let's let's roll with this. And, and then... So the conclusion there is that is 10 times, that is a factor of 10 higher positioning accuracy than required. Um, yeah, so, but then at the same time, when you come here, we want to be ready with the, with the lead screws, or how do we treat that? So we also work on that in parallel. So, uh, well, that, that's that's quite a bit of work to get both uh, develop both the lead screw system and the pulley system. Right. So so are we okay to go just with the pulley system and really work that out and 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 get formal limitations documented? Yeah, well, because here's the deal. I mean, then we can go to, okay, so your mill does the 0.1 millimeter, but there's also ways to redo your circuit. If you did it, so what's the minimum um, required size on, on, on your circuit? Is it 0.1 or or you could do with less than that? 
Uh, with more than that, rather. Like, hold on. What, what, what was your question? No, my question is like, okay, so, because say one test case of this is, okay, we're going to be making these little circuit boards for the power meter. Is there a way to increase the size of the, that board so it's actually doable with whatever we produce? If we, do, you know, say we, are, uh, we can only get to like two times, twice as bad resolution or something. Yeah. Can design your board around your limitations. That's that's what I did for this board. Um, but so the, the, what you can't design around is the size of some of the chips you might want to design boards for. Um, you so can't. You said you can't easy. can't design around that, or can? Well, I mean, if you have if you have like a a service mount device that you want to solder to your board, and the pins are spaced. You know, 0.1 millimeter apart, or you need to be able to. Right. You need to be able to. You need to do that, obviously. Right, and then we can choose bigger, um, bigger resistors, right? And. Sure. And then, what about for the sockets for the for the chips themselves? Are there sockets that expand the the pin size, for example? Uh yeah. Is that, that practical? They, they do make converters. Yeah. Um. See, but that I mean that would be boards. You'd have to like buy the converter boards in order to do that, but it's definitely within reason. So it's like this other socket that your smaller socket plugs into, right? Yes, exactly. Are those? Is that a practical way to go, or is that too expensive or too ridiculous? Or? Uh, I mean, it it's definitely done. Uh, I would say it's too expensive. Like the boards are pretty cheap. Uh, let me just find an example here for you. You think you think firsthand it's it's too expensive? Well, no, let, me, let me see. Let me just see real quick. But you can get. Oh, here's here's a good example. I, I'm just gonna post this to. So what that is? That's like uh, a SOP package, which is an SMD, like it's service mount, and you just so this is. Uh, how many? Share your screen. Oh, okay. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so they're, they're I'll boot this up. 20 boards, and you just break them all apart, and so you get you can turn a service mount component and do a through hole component essentially. Okay. So you just you'd solder it on that, and that that applies to like various different chips, right? You can put. Yeah. On that one, you have what two, four, six? Like how many legs? You got like 16 or so. And you can use whatever, say, like, you need eight of them or something? Yeah, yeah, eight you can legs. Just use whatever size you want, just not solder the rest of it. Uh, so, I mean, for seven bucks, I mean, that makes it practical, right? Is that practical? Yeah, I, I, mean, I would say so. So that's yeah. 20 right there for seven bucks. That's, that's doable. Five times four is 20. And they've got another one there for fifty for the same price too, right up there. Oh wait, is that the same? Almost. That's a four. That's a four, four pin one. For fifty of them for the same price. Okay, I mean that that could be practical. So, so okay. So let's look at those pins now. Is that what we're talking about there? Is that two point three millimeter for the final pins? Uh, yeah, uh, that's one point two seven millimeters. For the oh wait, oh wait yeah for for the through hole pins that's two point five millimeters yeah so you, you can you can probably mill that with a lot of different resolutions so I think that would be fine. So is um, that interesting to Dr. Pierce or to the world that you know we get this super inexpensive CNC circuit mill that can do that? Yeah, right. I mean that's that'll be, still be good, right? Or is that crappy? Uh, be ideal to not have to buy other circuit boards in order to, to make your circuit board. That, I mean, that's essentially what these are, just like other circuit boards. So I I, I, I don't know, honestly, I don't know how much value there would be in something where you had to buy a lot of adapters. Okay. It, 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 would, be, it would be cheap in, in a pinch of work, but I think that we should still shoot for a system that can do the board no, uh, all on its own. definitely. I mean, definitely that's what we're going to shoot for. But if we don't achieve that, 
you know, is this a bunch of wasted effort or? Um, I mean, I don't look at it. I mean, the, the one thing where we actually test the actual formal limits, that's that's a good data point, right, to build on. Yeah. That I definitely see valuable. Now, would you would you guys be able to actually publish something like that? Like, this is the limit of, would that be an applied publishable paper or, or not really? That's too pedestrian. Um, I don't know in that, that regard. That that had to be that had to be a Dr. Pierce question. Uh huh. Um, like that stuff. So when I, you, I can talk to him about that Monday. Right. What, what when you talk to him, that. he was actually okay that if we were to test the limits of the belt-driven system as opposed to definitely having the the backup of the the lead screw. Yeah. I, yeah. I said. I said kind of. I framed it as the objective is to make a uh, to just get a working circuit board mill for you and so I said we're gonna we're gonna test out the belt driven system and if it doesn't work or doesn't work favorably then we'll go to the lead screw uh, so by the time I leave you have something to replicate these boards with right but but does that imply that we have to to uh, do the lead screw at that time uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't really know it, it might should we talk to him about that? We should find out what, what his expectations are to be clear on that because if, if he wants sure. the lead screw route to be explored in parallel, we, we'd have to make it happen. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. I, I'll, I'll get clarification of what he really wants there. Okay. Yeah, just, just ask him to clarify so that we know because we, we can definitely make that happen. It just means we have to put a little more resource on that and uh, um, that's that. Do you have an, you know, at MTU, I mean, are there, because actually we got Chaz working with us. I don't know if you know him, but he's from MTU. Uh, he's taking okay. some of Dr. I, I, Pearson. I know him. Yeah. But uh, are there any other people we can try recruiting from MTU? Like, is there any decent channels to do that? Or do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I don't know. You know, cause okay. I've, I've only been at Michigan Tech for, I've, I've been here for a year now. Okay. Um, yeah, so I haven't quite learned the ropes and mm -hmm. who's who. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, but that, that did just jog my memory. Uh, Dr. Pierce was wondering what, like, if if we could anyway frame this in a uh, as like a internship. -ish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so that should just be another uh, line on my CV. Definitely. Yeah, we yeah. could we could definitely do that as a. Something like that. Uh, we call those dedicated project visits, which is what what. Uh, what this is, yeah. Basically, we're doing some R and D work beforehand, and then you come for a dedicated project visit here. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can right. call we can cool. call that an internship or a dedicated project visit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So oh, wait. So are you looking more for a grad student? Or just no, it'll be all levels. Like for example, talent. no, I mean, just any any engineers who who can do work, like you know, like yourself. Where say you know say we have the the lead screw problem, well they could work with us right now in parallel as we develop the the belt drive, right? So we just need more bodies. Yeah. Working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so just. I'm, I'm not aware of anyone right now. Yeah. Is there a do you have a volunteer department that where people do vol various volunteer jobs? Uh. Because this would be volunteer. Not that I know of. Yeah. Typically, universities yeah. have that, like a service, community service kind of stuff. But anyway, okay, let's sure. save that, save it for later. Um, yeah, so we can clarify that, but we definitely go forward with the belts. So we, we just the the relevant question is, do we are we also going to prepare materials for the the other the lead screw? Which I mean, that's a done deal. We just do that, and we know it's we're going to get it to work. So I mean, that that would basically be uh, redesigning the current axis for the lead screw now. Um, ball screws, can you do this with lead screw as opposed to ball screw? Um, do you know? I assume so. I can't see why not. Okay, I, I because... Would be able to, be fine. Yeah, yeah. Because there's three routes, like the super pre precision, you got the ball screws, then you got lead screws for acceptable, and then... Um, like, I, I personally think that would be a really good 
paper to if this is doc I, I mean I haven't seen this documented as far as the the practical limits but it would be not really nice to document it so um, did, did Dr. Pierce talk anything about the papers that could be coming out of the circuit mill project he said that he thinks that something's yeah. possible there he has said that uh, he doesn't know if it will if it would get published just because a couple mill papers out there um so, do they do those mill papers help us any? Uh, do you know? Have you done? Uh... I I don't know. I I can uh I can do some research and see what's been done and what what they use. Uh... Okay, so I'm adding a page yeah. here. There's one calendar page. I'm adding a literature search. Sure. Search page, so we can put that in there. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I think what we could do is, uh, you know, like, in cases where you have to do this interface board, mm -hmm. it's definitely not optimal, but I mean, in what cases is that acceptable and practical? Yeah. So, it, I mean... There's, there's not really any case where it's not. I mean, if you have to unless, do it, you do it, right? Yeah, unless you're just trying to make something small. Like, so, for example, for for my power node, power node, I mean, so the, the, the boards probably, would probably be, uh, well, I don't, I don't have any service mode components on it, so you'd probably be able to make this just about the size that it currently is. I mean, so most of the ICs that you're going to be doing for your simple circuits, I mean, you're, you're not going to be trying to build it anytime soon, I don't think. Um, so most, like, simple utility circuits, you can find through-hole chips for. So, uh, so crying over uh, the SMD, I don't think it's that big of an issue because you should be able to find a through-hole alternative for. So even for the... The AVR pro you've got an AVR processor there. Well, yeah. So, so the one, the one on this board, the that's just like an eight-pin dip package. Uh, so that, that's a dual in-line package. That's so that's through hole. So, uh, so I think you can get you can get like uh, quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure you can get a through hole package of even the. Arduino, the ML chip on the Arduino Mega. It's like a really big, big friggin' chip, but you can get it through the whole equivalent of it. Let me, let me see. Yeah, can you see that? Take a look at that. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think this is this is good. Uh, uh, so, uh, mm -hmm. Martin, I did figure out, so my resolution on my CNC is uh, 0 0.76 millimeters per step. So, you said 0 0.76? 0 0.0076. 0 0.0076 0 0 step, step size. Yeah. And and how much is your backlash? It, it's about uh, so the backlash is uh, I've measured um, is zero point one two seven zero point one two seven backlash. Yes. And do you know? So that's. Have you figured out oh, what accounts for that? 0 0.127? Yeah, so uh, ironically enough, that's the anti backlash nut. That's, <laughs> it's still not working perfect. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I can I can watch when I go really slowly, I can watch the backlash nut like adjust when it changes direction. And during that like transient period when it's adjusting on the uh -huh. carriage. Yeah. Uh, Is it. It's not a ball screw, it's a lead screw? It's a lead screw, yeah. 
Okay. But it's acceptable. It works. So okay. So we know this lead screw can can do it. Can you source the lead screw? Their lead screw parts. Uh, I don't know what was used on this, but I mm -hmm. could probably find something. I can find the same exact thing. Um, yeah. So I, I I can look into that. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to put that, that's on page four. I'm going to say that's for you, lead screw sourcing. So, you know, so that, yeah, we can definitely prepare that and modify our access to, to make that work with that. Uh, how much do you think is coming from the, the shaft of the stepper motor slide pushing in and out? Did you measure any of that? I've never, um, I, uh, I would assume that's negligible. Negligible. So you could... You like as far as the lead screw nut. The did you actually measure what that quantity there was compared to point one to seven? Uh, or you wait, just like so by what, eye, like I'm, I'm, when you say uh, actually, I was going to. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Can you point your camera to what you're doing? Yeah. And then, so you can see the, the back, the anti backlash mechanism, same for all axes. So it's just two nuts pushed apart by springs. And so, sorry, it's a little blurry. But I, I can see this right here. I can see when it turns, uh, I, I can see when it transfers to the other nut when it goes the other direction. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I, I'm pretty sure that's definitely the the source of the back. Yeah. Crash. Okay. You're talking about it slipping in and out of this component. Yes. Not not slipping in through that component, but the actual shaft oh. inside the stepper motor. You're, you're, yeah, like the oh, oh, the actual stepper motor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I've never I've never validated that. Yeah, I, I haven't. I haven't really had to figure out what backlash was. I have my theory that mainly just the anti backlash knot, but I just after I measure it. Yeah. Um, no, you're right. So I'm, I've got a stepper motor in my hand here, and I'm pu pulling on a shaft. And no, it seems to be perfectly fixed um, axially. So yeah, that's probably not it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Okay, but look at this. I mean, look at what we have so far. Yours is 0 0.0076 millimeter step size, which you measured with a dial indicator. Yes. You have a yeah, metric so, so, or a or a millimeter dial indicator. Well, so what what I did is my steps per millimeter to be a millimeter, and I moved it one millimeter, and I measured uh, I measured thirty. So I divided my thirty thousands by, and then put that to millimeters. Um, so the dial indicator, you won't when you just move one step. You can't measure it that way. Uh, I let's try and move it one step. I I just kind of did a. You did more, but you could do. You could probably measure it from the one step, right? Because. Yeah. I mean that would be like. That would be kind of like the more accurate way to do that, because there you're averaging, and you—that's you, not really the measurement you want. Okay. But you know, the the cool thing about this project here, we could we could get very rigorous on. Okay, here's our protocols for all these measurements, and get some really good data on that. Okay. But anyway, if you if you do 0 0.0076 millimeter step size, our theoretical value is. 0 0.013 so we're twice only twice as bad um, as yours 
Uh, so uh, that's. I, I was gonna say. So I'm, I'm asking this right now, and I can't. I can't see my deflection on. on the game uh huh. Okay. But I mean, the step is so small that it might be slipping. Sometimes the stepper motor has to do a couple steps. Uh huh. So. Okay. All right. Um, but okay, it's it's uh, doable. Then we can look at the. Yeah, so we definitely explore the lead screw route. Because they actually do that. I've seen a 3D printer which had all lead screws in it, fast lead screws. So. Yeah. You know, it's definitely. Yeah, it's definitely either route is doable because um you can make an axis like right now we've got highly these highly modular axes right now with the belts but you can get a pretty much a corresponding design with the lead screw lead screw um, but it's not as convenient because the motors are mounted different it's i don't I actually don't think it's as easy to work with as the one we have right now okay but anyway okay so that's good 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 um let's see so the feature size the one that allows you to do what you've done right now is is you have to get down to 0.1 millimeter cut sizes and 0.5 millimeter trace widths that's that's the requirement for the current board yeah yeah and so so the, that uh the end mill in there it cuts probably more than 0.1 millimeter um mm -hmm. traces ultimately they they don't turn out to be no, let, let me, let me, Instead of just speculating, let me, let me tell you what I designed for mm -hmm. uh, from my mill. So, so my traces, my 0.5 millimeter traces, when I measure them, that's kind of the hard thing to measure. Uh, hold up. Just a second. So, that's... I measure about a 0.45 millimeters, and my my actual my actual cut really not easy to measure with this. But my actual cut is by it's about 0.2 millimeters. Mm -hmm. So my, my trace was designed for 0.5 millimeters, and what I actually got is about and my cut was my was about 0.2 millimeters rather than 0.1. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, you achieved point, oh. point 0.2, but you were kind of designing for 0.1. Yeah, so that, that's why you make you make your uh, traces a little bit bigger than you need to because you're gonna have a little bit of loss. You do. Then you just look at the end mill. The end mill's kind of shaped, and so when you the moment you start cutting in further, you push when you cut that in it's going to yeah. cut wider what so. is the is there anything above the copper or that's just copper does it have a layer of something on it uh no so it's just copper and fiberglass underneath and so mm -hmm. i i i cut in uh 0.125 millimeters is what i what i plunge in so when i go through my zero ring procedure after that it's cutting in 0.125 millimeters. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, the copper thickness, never measured it. At least I can figure out what it actually is. Uh, it's, it's, it's like tiny thin, so mm -hmm. can't measure how thick do the you ever get, is, Do you ever get issues when you plunge into the copper because of the fiberglass, you actually chip off chunks of the copper and you mess up a trace? Uh, so you're saying like uh, burrs? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I haven't had any. Uh, I haven't had like it being too aggressive to the point where it's like peeling up copper. I haven't had that yet. Mm -hmm. so How's the copper stuck? I've had... How do does the copper stick? Is there some adhesive or it's it's? It, yeah. It, it must be some sort of adhesive like. Uh, they probably just use like uh, impregnated fiberglass and then let it solidify 
they probably you probably just get away with taking the copper and just putting it right on top of it before the fiberglass uh, solidifies. And I, I'm not I'm not really sure how to make. The, mm -hmm. So it's like epoxying the, uh, it to. So essentially epoxying it to the board. Yeah. So uh, so I mean the, the adhesive on the. Uh, it's it's decent then until you really start messing with things like if you unsolder a through hole component and you're kind of pulling on it or pushing it, uh, it's really easy. It's somewhat easy to uh, accidentally pop one of your traces up off your board, and then you risk you know you, you can you can try and repair that or you might just be able to pull right back down or you might accidentally rip your trace. Um, that's Definitely conceivable. But anyway, okay. um, all right. I can't remember what's going with that. Okay, okay. So let's let's just talk about a little bit. Uh, so we got literature search for later, lead screw sourcing. So we got the mechanical. We'll get that all done. Uh, but the calendar. So let's take a look at that. So that's maybe like uh, sure. kind of like day by day what we see. Um, so we've got basically like 14 days or something. Uh, so if oh, you, yeah. okay. can you help me out on that calendar there? So um, day one would be like install, install open source power meet. I would expect day two would be to, to shake down the OSPM. Sure. Uh, and then we we'll work on the mill. Oh, uh, we can do. I think uh, probably do is we we get a we start with a frame that we already have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Frame done. Let's see. What are the? I mean, if we get the frame done, or we can. I mean, not necessarily done, but at least if we do this, we probably want to do. Well, no. Let's build it. Let's say the frame build. I don't think we're gonna have that done. We might, yeah, yeah. We'll have the materials for everything. So the build starts here. Um, build the frame. So let's see. If you probably got no in there because you're gonna run out of space for little squares. Sorry, say it again. I take mill out, out of there for now because I think the rest of it's gonna be mill. Space. Yeah. Um, so what are the next steps? So we say we attach. So it's pretty much frame. So attach axes. So for that, I mean, we have the. If we've got the spindle, attach axes. I think the third day is spindle mount. Uh, plus. The bed. I mean, I, I don't know how each of these these steps, but the bed. You know, bed. Um, bed install. Then electronics and software. And software, and then. That's the first seven days. Yeah, and then we got seven days to. I would say like that's testing. I mean, uh, hopefully that's how how it works. I mean, what are the risks here? I think um, if we f well, figure out all the belt stuff and we know, okay, we're definitely going with that. We um, and we run. We start running some sample codes. We should prepare some sample codes. Like we gotta. So so we'll, I, I've got I've got lots of uh, sample G code ready that can be used. So that's. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm just I'm just thinking like in terms of my circuit board mill, it was made. I, I had to assemble it, um, but I, I probably spent like yeah I had to I had to work kind of on and off like maybe twenty to thirty hours worth of debugging it just to get it to. Um, okay, what what kind of debugging? Uh, so. It was figuring out. Uh, it was figuring out this backlash issue because yeah, 
that, that was kind of loose components and finding um, some drifts and just aches. Um, and then other, other debugging issues was uh, my leveling software, um, finding a good way to really uh, fix you know, or copper such that it'll be flat. Like, and also... Uh, also figuring out parameters to like figuring out how far I should plunge. So a lot of that work is already done because I've just done that before. Um, each system is probably going to be a little bit unique. So yeah, um, plunge depth refinement. Yeah, what's the what are the forces? So like, let's go to some calculations here. Um, so some calculations. What are the forces required? Like when you plunge, uh, do you have a feeling for what that is? Like, is it five pounds or? I. Uh, this is like I need to hold a weight in my hand. Um, I'm gonna need to hold a weight in my hand. Yeah. So, so five pounds. Uh, that would prob probably be a reasonable number. I'm, I'm holding a five pound weight right now. And so the spindle that I use is 1,000 RPM, um, 10,000 RPM with five pounds of force. I think that should be efficient in order to be able to plunge mm -hmm. into, uh, into the copper. Now, uh, hold up. Let me think, though, because that's if you want to mill the board, but then when you want to do your cutout, I'm kind of lazy and mill all the way through it. So that's uh, 1.6 milliliters that I plunge in and, and the rectangle around my board. So I can, like cut it out of my raw material. So, so at the very end, you cut it out. More, more at the, sorry, at the very end, you, you just don't cut it so far. You could, you could cut it out of your board in multiple passes. Uh-huh. So, uh, so I, I, I guess I... So five pounds is for sure good to mill. Uh, I'm questionable if, if you could do that to cut out the board, though. Uh huh. Uh, so, maybe, so maybe like ten. Maybe ten pounds of uh, downforce would probably be something good to design. How much? Ten. Yeah, ten. Ten pounds on each axis would probably be. Ten pounds lateral. Yeah. That would be for milling or for cutting? Yes. Uh, well, so ten, 10 pounds for cutting. So you need at least five. I would say you need at least five to mill and 10 to cut things out. Okay. Okay. And for through holes, you'd say probably like five pounds? Yeah, when you're drilling, yeah. Five pounds of force. That's pretty fine. Mm hmm. Alright. Yeah, I mean, that should all be doable. I mean, not a problem. Using the little, I mean, the NEMA 17s, we, we can mount actually. The way we can do our stuff is we can use two motors per axis because that's how it. Uh, the universal axis works. You can put two, two motors, one sure. and just one on each side. That'll, that'll be fine. Uh, but as is, they have enough force. Ours, ours have. I mean, the force is 16 pounds currently for that. How much does the spindle weigh? Like a couple of pounds? It probably, it probably weighs maybe two pounds. Do you have a link for the spindle like know. that? Yeah, let, me, let me see if I can find one on Amazon. Uh, it's not cooled, right? It's just air cooled. Uh, so the spindle has a fan on top of it. Like it, it's like built on, so it, it it's, it's, the fan spins at its speed. Okay. It's ten thousand RPM spindle. I uh this is like I'm gonna lately verify that too. Uh, uh, 
and we don't want to use one of those crappy little um, you know uh, those little router things as a tool head right like a, like a Dremel. yeah I, I've seen I've seen people do it with a Dremel it's definitely it's definitely possible but it's harder because it's less accurate Ooh. I well if we're probably gonna I really don't know it, it might it might be reasonable to do that should we um, try that or I think I think it would be look at look at this right here. Uh, uh, should I put this? Uh, maybe parts. Okay. So. So check uh, check this guy out. That this is a just like a 500 watt CNC spindle. Okay, put the le link in there. Oh, well, I put I, I made like a part slide. Oh. Okay, yeah. But in, anyway, 35 bucks. And it comes with the, the, the spindle and and the power supply. And you can control the speed. Mine is a fixed speed. I just run it full. Uh, but it might be good to have that capability. And the, it comes with all the different size trucks. So... So we're talking 135 versus versus 35 bucks. So, um, um, do you know if the people with the regular spindles they get any performance, or that's that's like more toys? Uh, what, what's that? When you use a Dremel, do you get any performance, or that's like not really good? Uh, I man, 500 I watts. I mean, that's like way overkill for what we have in our system, right? What's what's the what's the wattage on yours? Do you know? Is that the similar? Uh, let me, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Well, five hundred watts. I mean, that's uh. We're talking about this is now scalable to. Some more serious hey. cutting. Cut like aluminum with mine, even. Stop selling the mill that I have. If, I don't, I'm not sure how legal the design was. So I feel like you got pirated from somewhere or something. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I'm afraid to find documentation on it now because uh, uh, hold on. Anyway, yeah. So that's. The, the one that I link to is the to work um, mm -hmm. in a Dremel maybe I've, I've seen I've seen like DIY DIY sort of what those that use Dremels um, it's been done You should look at uh, Shape Oko for what they do because they have two versions. One is their more precise, one is less. I think they, I don't know what they do, but. Uh. Yeah,
bolt screw plus rail itself that's 135 bucks um, we would just need the ball screw itself so yeah we can say that if we did the ball screw that's you know it's maybe get it like as low as like 70 bucks or so have to look at that okay um, so that spindle they don't make any smaller ones We just have to look at those numbers. So what, let's see what yours says. Um, have you looked much for the spindles, or this is like the first time you're looking? Uh, yeah, it's looking for something like this on my mill. So let's see what they say for some details. Five pounds, five hundred. Yeah. I don't say much as far as the specs like lateral forces or anything or plunge force okay, let's see um, diameter 4 amp torque 5 torque is 5,000 grams per centimeter okay gram centimeters it's not per it's gram centimeters so fine let's see what that translates to 5,000 grams or 5 kilogram centimeter equals five kilogram centimeters Five kilogram centimeter point three six foot pounds point four foot pounds inch pound. Point four times About five foot pounds. Documentation for it. Mm. Cutting torque. Okay, cutting torque. How does cutting? Do you have a? Do you understand how to relate cutting torque to force of pushing it? Have you ever looked into that? How much push I, force? I, I haven't. Okay, that's something to look at. I'll yeah. have to get familiar with that. So, so this yeah, thing has got f about five inch pounds so what, what, what of are, torque. What are, at, what are you looking at right now? I'm looking at the it's torque, but that's cutting torque. You're looking at the that spindle that I linked. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm sure it's way more than adequate for what we need to do. I'm just trying to understand those numbers. Sure. It says torque is 5,000 gram centimeters. Um, so I think that's... Well, we know that's going to be way more than we need, but... Um, let's see what we find for 250 watt... 
air-cooled spindle. Let's see if they have that. Five hundred watt. No, I mean what you're showing is like the minimum. Looks kind of like the smallest size. Oh, oh, oh I, I, I think I found the one I have. Okay. Show me. Okay, 400 watts. You got yours is 400 watts. Yeah, it must be. And that comes without the power this, supply. This is... Yeah, but yeah, that so, we can we so can just I use like a. Mm -hmm. so what, what I have is I have a transformer that's taking 120 down to 48 volts AC. Mm -hmm. So the DC motor so I have it rectified and did you set up that system yourself or that came with it that, that's what came with it Getting something like that wouldn't be that hard no. yeah okay very cool so so I mean 60 bucks is much better yeah well but the transformer the transformer is probably gonna cost like I'm looking at there's a $36 power supply right below that 48 volts so that'll be another 35 right yeah but you can use i mean i'm sure you can i mean we don't need 500 watts for milling circuits um if we're right right so so if we use something like this then we can make the machine no i would say we don't worry not worry about more than circuits right now because i mean that's going to be yeah. a different game so we're worrying about circuits, so this is way more than you need for power, so you can use even a regular 12-volt power supply. You're going to have plenty of force, don't you think? Yeah, but, but, but hold up. You need... The thing is, you need... You need that speed in order to cut the copper cleanly. Oh, okay. To so you need the... Speed, you need to 48. Apply that, that armature. Okay. Yeah, so... so Okay, so we can get that 35 bucks for the power supply, or we can choose the other one. Okay, but no, that's really good. Uh, I think that's good. Uh, not bad. Yeah. I mean, they have they have tiny, tiny spindles. Like, in fact, um, oh, let me show you something we've used. Uh, it was called Hydra Faber. We did a small prototype with a really, uh, you know, like a $10... Hydrofiber open source ecology, okay. Um, it's like a little DC motor. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll is that is that doable too, or that's too low, bro? Yeah, hold on a sec. Oh yeah, look look at this. Uh, take a look at this. We did this uh, a few years ago. Uh, look at the link. Okay. 
That's what we have done before, and um, let's okay. see. So we've got that little bearing thing. Yeah, I mean. Is that, is that something you're, is that? We've done it. In fact, we have that part right here. Do you think that's worth doing that? So what you need there is you have a separate separate bearing and uh, check they can get up to 10,000 rpm oh yeah that's a little 10,000 rpm little spindle motor um, you know, we should evaluate what what's you know what's the trade-offs like if that little motor lasts I mean there's no that thing is good enough I haven't I don't remember any of its performance specs, but for I'm, I mean I'm sure for milling it's adequate because we borrowed this from. Do you know the MIT um, snap lock CNC? We borrowed it from uh, there. No, I don't have snap lock CNC. Wow, we got all these nice CAD drawings from from before. Look at that first first image that pops up. That's what yeah that's what we can do, and I think the price is like. What's the price on that? We can look at our documentation. No, this is good. That's uh, actually we can build so, upon it. So we can choose either the off the shelf or we can do our own, our, well, our complete own. If, if, if you have that, yeah, it might be worth it to just go on Amazon. Yeah. And buy some cop, buy some PCB material. Yep. And just hook it to a power supply and see how it cuts. Like by hand. By hand. Yeah. Why not? Okay, we could do that. Um, damn, look at that page. Someone did that all nice. And there's a page called, uh, yeah, so Hydrofaber page on the wiki. So that link, I'm linking the Hydrofaber to, yeah, we can do either one, but yeah, we should kind of evaluate what we get out of that. If it's, my only concern would be like the motor burning out. If that thing can get you countless hours of service, They'll be perfectly fine because it's also 3D printed, so it'll be a very low cost way to go. Like you can probably with like ten, twenty dollars, you can get away with making that spindle yourself if you buy the bearings and everything else. Uh, but we should compare the prices and compare the trade-off benefit. Mm -hmm. But it's something we've been thinking about for some time. Um, yeah, yeah, we, and we should choose the thing that fits our style most. So okay, uh, there's different options. I think the Dremel, I, I don't really like that idea because because uh, the Dremel route is a thing where the thing breaks and those things are gonna wear out, you just throw it away. Whereas here it's like if you if your motor breaks, you just replace you know like a five dollar little motor, you know. Yeah. So things like that. Okay, but this is good. So so I think um, you know the, this leads me to think would we be, you know I I'd be inclined to think, what if we did um, that weekend. Do you think we should do something like a, like an experimental workshop, where we invite some people and and we um, we actually hold it as an education experience, or is that putting too much into on the plate? Uh, so you're saying for circuit board milling or circuit board yeah. design, or what yeah, yeah, like if you're there, no, just like a workshop that shows people, okay, here how here's how you build this mill. We build one, we do some milling. We, it's, it's an education, and we document that. Uh, make a little course out of that, you know. Uh, is that too much? Putting... Yeah, it... Are you open to that, or does that sound like putting too much on a plate for that that week, those two weeks? Because uh, well, the question is, how much preparation would we need to do that? Like, if we're building this and we actually got it working and stuff, we could call it an experimental CNC milling workshop where we show the entire tool chain of how you build it how you level it like that that kind of thing and it won't, you know we don't necessarily have to have a perfect product but it would be definitely a, a lot of good content in there that people would be willing to come for yeah, my, 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 my only fear about committing to something that near to us working on it is like too much risk the worst case scenario like, yeah if it like fails miserably yeah yeah we'll, we'll stay away from that then but yeah, yeah. That's all right. So, 
so just to see how those days work like if we're you know things are working we have the backup for the lead screw uh, we've got a good week to develop it I think we should get a lot of good stuff done and then um, how would we, how would it work at that point like uh, so you'd be you'd be working on that the whole time uh, how much of that time because two weeks I don't think I can give you a hundred percent of the time on those two weeks but what what would you need to make this really really well, valuable so probably you're saying what would I need from other people's help or your help yeah um so probably definitely I, I want somebody with me for the for the power meter the entire yeah. time yeah you know, electricity and all that stuff yep um, but and then figuring out like the the frame build it'd probably go faster someone who know who knew yeah the, yeah definitely could do that frame. so building the the base printer uh-huh and then so kind of i guess i'm looking at the the first part of the week i think yeah. i could have somebody with me and then the second part of the week yeah it could be me uh, kind of going to town on my own yeah and then especially with the with the software and calibration and stuff yeah sure mm -hmm. yeah so we can do we can get up to the full the the power meter will be there and then we're going to get up to the the frame drive and spindle and from there like with the electronics software calibration actual cutting i can just We'll pretty much check in on you on that and see how it's going. Yeah. yeah, that would be good. Yeah, no, we should have something pretty good uh, come out of this. Be pretty good. So. Yeah. What else do we want to cover today? Because we got a good start on all this. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, I think so. You're gonna have you or somebody else who's gonna start working on kind of the mechanical design of this. Yeah, we'll get. Um, what I'll do is get some of my CAD team to jump on this as far as the CAD work, so we get the full files, and I'll print out any necessary parts. I'm gonna assume that we're gonna do the the belt drive, but I guess do we also want to prepare the CAD files for the yeah, I mean, we'd have to prepare the CAD files and the full design for the um, the lead screw version. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll have to get somebody on that. And we've got a pretty much a month, month and six weeks to more month and a week or so to prepare for that. Um, so month and two yeah, weeks. So also, probably like a like an Excel. Or, uh, Google's, a Google, uh, whatever, whatever they call it, their spreadsheet. Spreadsheet? Uh, yeah, for, for bill of materials. Yep. So, we can make that, and I can kind of, uh, I can kind of watch and see what you guys are thinking of ordering, or what I should pop in there. Yep. Uh, to make, make sure we have ordered in there by the time I get there. Mm hmm. Yeah. The main things are what do we need specifically for the spindle. So basically, like spindle plus lead screw are outstanding. Like we need to make some decisions on that. Otherwise, the frame and drive system were good, but we have to design the new the the lead screw drive system. So what what kind of electronics do you have to control the printer? The only thing we have lying around is is a bunch of ramps with okay. we've been running running Marlin. Okay. But um, let's see. So can we make? Okay. I mean, the software route. What do we do there? Can we just do two dimensional things in Marlin? Yeah, I, I would assume that'd be fine. We can definitely figure that out. So. Uh, the software that I use for my uh, to convert my design to Gco mm -hmm. is called Flatcam. So if if you get bored 
people are, are curious, you can look into that. But that's so not open that's source? Flatcam is open source. Oh, Flatcam is open source, okay. Converts it converts 2D to, to G code. It takes, a, it takes a Gerber file, which is like the universal mm -hmm. uh, thing that you export your PCB design to. Oh, awesome! And it slices that into G code. Excellent, excellent. It, it makes your tool path. Yeah. Actually. Okay, that sounds great. So, um, yeah, we'll figure out 2D Marlin for milling. We're gonna have to get that code, like the little. If you can do that backlash corrector code yeah definitely that i mean that that will just be like half day project mm -hmm. and of course look for stuff that already exists have you looked for whether that exists already i haven't yes uh, it's been done a hundred times but i guess if nobody publishes it's not available but yeah should be uh Eventually, like what we'll do is like we're recruiting people for FreeCAD. What I see there is that FreeCAD gets a gets a CNC milling module uh, workbench where that would do that automatically. In fact, I could, uh, if I have any time, I can check in with some of the FreeCAD people, see what work's been done. I know Yorick has been doing a lot of work on the cam in FreeCAD, and he might have some backlash correction stuff already. I'll check in with him. Um, so, have you looked at the FreeCAD cam workbench at all? Uh, I, I haven't really done anything with FreeCAD ever. Okay, yeah. But, uh, yep. But, I'll just check in on that, but we'll figure something out. That, and, and eventually, of course, we make it really robust and, and good. But, sure. um... Huh. And then you got the Franklin, but man, I it's like... I ain't gonna touch it if there's no documentation. Only a few people in the world know how to use that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was just going with Marlin until... Unless we get Boss, you, you met Boss. You, you were you around when he was there? I I, I started going to school there just as he was graduating. You met him? So I, I, yeah, I was just meeting him when he left. Yeah, but I don't know. He's he's definitely working on it right now. But he, you know, that's a steep learning curve there. And without documentation, I'm not really yeah excited about going there. Well, so yeah, well, from our our project. I don't know if this is interest you at all. Mm -hmm. Another project I'm working on, or will be working on soon, is a. I'm kind of taking the concept that I use for your power meter, yeah, and applying it to 3D printer controllers. Yep. Where uh, you can basically control as many axes as as many steppers as you want. They're just like addressable, and you can have as many of them mirrored as you want. <laughs> Okay, that's pretty cool. Cause um, what I was, what we're doing right now is the universal controller, which is like that, but only five channels, except unlimited numbers of motors. But they're doing the same thing. So yeah, okay. just a, just well, a bigger stepper. Just, I mean, the ramps works with you. You just connect it to a bigger stepper driver, and you can con connect as many devices as well, that driver can handle. So what I'm doing is I'm the G code is going to be pretty foreign from normal G code, so it's going to have to take a little bit of working with. Yeah. But basically, you put your I squared C address instead of your axis name in there, and you can just give it a command. Uh huh. And they have a system where you can put in multiple cards, and so that card might be like uh, just a low power stepper driver or high, so you can have four uh, channels on a card, or high power where you can have two channels on a card, or maybe it's something completely different, like it's a. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's like some sort of uh, laser driver for like an optical device that you're controlling. Do you have a specific... Uh, do you have a specific... you can put that G-code as well. Yeah, definite, definite uh, good stuff. Do you have a specific applications where you need so many right now, or this is uh, just... Well, so there's these guys... Uh, well, University of Maryland, they're trying to 3D print heat exchangers. Uh -huh. And they're doing it... They have like multiple heads. You want to have like a... 20 extruder 3D printer. Um, so I have to go up with a system to drive okay. all of that. Yeah, but why don't. So each of them is independent? Well, they, want, they eventually want to be able to get to that point. 
I mean, because right now you can do the big stepper driver on a on non-independent ones, and I mean we can yeah. do you know like nine heads no problem right now. But then of course you probably need to start needing to have them independent because the height control on each one of them is going to be an issue. You yeah, know. You're gonna be able to count by each one. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, okay, so that's, but, yeah, uh, that's a pro project you guys are collaborating with, or. Yeah, that's something we're we're doing with the University of Maryland. Okay, yeah, so definite purpose for that. No, that that is very interesting. It's uh, we don't have a specific use for that right now, though, because well, everything I mean, else, we can, do. Otherwise, with the, with the existing state of art is, um, yeah, but definitely no good stuff, definitely. Definitely interesting if that were available. All right, so what's next steps? So yeah. yeah, next steps are you know to get some of these designs, specify the materials. Let's see on our side, get the CAD going as soon as possible. Specify the materials, settle on some of the materials, and then on your side, whatever time you have to, you know, you're shaking down a, the open source power meter and anytime you have think about the the control tool chain because right now you can't use the same control tool chain that you have because some of the parts are proprietary correct yeah so, so that's just for controlling the 3D printer or the 3D printer the mill right um yeah so the i mean the only outstanding thing is like on your side if you can just really get familiar with okay how do we how do we use existing marlin to make it happen because the other routes are you use, you know, Gerbil, right? Using what? Gerbil, G R B L. That's uh, another way to stream stream data. Um, I'm not sure how that relates to ramps. I mean, ramps is a is a well, yeah. Without without introducing anything, I think the the one ready route that we can do, without putting too many complications, is just using two dimensional forms of of ramps, Marlin. That's that sounds like the easiest. Route because right now we're basically trying to solve the mechanical part, right? Yeah. So we solve one thing at a time. We do the mechanical. Uh, we work out that the belts are doable, but just use the simplest for the controls, which s sounds to me like Marlin plus plus ramps. So, but that means I mean there is you know since we haven't done that you know make sure we know how to do that. So document that and develop that fully so we have the full documentation and full um, process for how to do that. How do you generate like like this you know flat cam maybe that you use to generate the stuff or whatever like whatever the tool chains are going to be involved for like for example take what I, what you should do is take this the case case in point of your little circuit and use that as a test case for okay here's the open source tool chain for making that happen using this new open source circuit mill sure. using using marlin and ramps that, yeah, yeah, so I, just I can, try to focus that you know, tool chain to do it in software. Yeah. yeah, yep. So that'll be, um, maybe we should just put one one uh, slide there. So we got the literature search for former circuit mills. That would definitely help if you can do that. Um, yep. And then we've got the open source tool chain. So let's just put some requirements on that open source tool chain chain so we've got ramps marlin we've got um, gerber file to so well we got the keycad to gerber file yep uh, so keycad to gerber that's just done right in keycad mm -hmm. and we got the gerber to g-code Uh, then we've got the settings for our mill. So that's something we can look at once we get know the specific steps per revolution, all those features, so settings for our mill that we put into, I guess, into Marlin. Well, we already have those, so that should be. But we have to calibrate, like, do a little. The z-axis might change a little bit. Okay, settings for our mill. We've got what else we got there? So uh, fixing. Fixing work pieces, calibrating height plus level of work piece, uh, and doing a cut. What else did I miss? What what other steps are there? Um, uh, 
I think. And for level, just let me ask you about the level. Are we going to use, um, like, the sensor that the... Do you think we can use the the height sensor, the, the inductive sensor? I've never messed with it. From... Because we have that working, and a question from... From RepRap, from uh, D3D, let's say D3D is our distributed enterprise 3D printer. So that sensor works. I'm not. I don't have any information about its accuracy, but I'm sure. I guess it's probably not good enough to do that fraction of a millimeter. But I don't know. I mean, I, I know it senses at four millimeters. I don't know how accurate it is up and down. So pretty much like touch off would be the only way to go, probably. Yes. Touch off calibration. Yeah, I think. Well, so. Uh... Uh, well, that, so that, that's not that big of a deal. I, w I wouldn't worry about, well, so, so we, we can maybe try your sensor and then we can try my system. But once again, all I want to be able to do is validate that the hardware is working. Oh, yeah. Um, well, but the hardware working means that we have to do reliable calibration too. So we, we got to yeah, get... Well, so I, I know that I know that my leveling system it's slow because you have to do it manually, but mm -hmm. I also know that it works. Let's um, let's not introduce these complications here. Let's do let's do your system. Okay. So then, just mo modify. So make sure we have so so create create calibration procedure files. Yeah. G code files. Right. Or somehow, uh, how do you implement the calibration? Right now, you move it manually by hand, or I move it manually by hand. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, we could can we automate that just to to do a procedure in G code, and then we just read it. So it's a little more than by hand. Yeah, it, it might it might be reasonable to automate it. The only reason I couldn't automate it in mine is because all the electronics are hardware or uh, are closed source ish. So. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so we should definitely do that because we're open source here. So uh, that way we have a calibration procedure, just like it has a calibration procedure right now. Like you run that at the beginning of every print. This yeah. we can do this, but then see the the part that sucks though. How much how much Marlin have you done? I I've never done anything. Never well, done it. So like G code or no Marlin. See, because then yeah. how do you? Man, the so the interface there, you have to right now in Marlin, the the machine generates this matrix of heights, and then it uses that matrix to do the correction, and that's what we want to do. But you can't do that unless you go into Marlin to modify it. Which sounds like now Marlin is another one of those things. It's not once you start doing stuff, no, it's not documented. The basic stuff is documented, yeah. but it won't let you. You won't know how to hack it because it's not documented. So what do we do there? Uh, the only ways we can do it is either get the developers from Marlin to help out or use some other software. No, no, no. I, I, don't, I, I, still, I don't think any of that's necessary still. For, well, for, for, for automation, it probably is. Yeah. Well, I mean, to do a, you press return, it, it, it does the calibration and it cuts your board. Um, I mean, do you think we could get to that this time around, or no? It, you you hit cut, the, no. Yeah. So. So just do so. The expectations are manual calibration, and then how do we use the calibration matrix? You put it. How do you go from there? Uh, well, so, so you, just, you just measure your board, you put it into the software, and you export your G code that you're using. Um. So. But you're saying using the calibration matrix that Marlin generates? If, well, uh, if well, let me ask you how you do it. So you generate a calibration matrix of heights. Then how do you subtract those from the G-code that you have already for the, the Gerber file? So that, that just does, like, it does interpolation based off of the three points that define the plane that your G-code destination is in. And so... Uh, let me let me share my screen real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll make this 
so. Yeah, the, see, the, that's where, if we go into Marlin, that just sucks unless we have somebody from Marlin working with us. This is where it really calls for maybe just a simple standalone solution. Forget yeah. about Marlin. Um, so, yeah, what, what happens is, so you'd measure, you measure your points, say you only did four point calibration, say you did the four corners of your board, you measure here, 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 and here, and everything in your G-code, if it finds out, like, here's your offset and your actual X, if you figure out that you're here, then you use this equation right here to do your interpolation to figure out what height this is. So, like, you see here, like this so you correct. So you correct every point. Uh, yes. Yeah, you, you subtract your interpolated height from it. Oh, so you just subtract the height. So you just change the z values. And how do you how do you implement that change? So you generate your code. And then what do you do? You you use a script well, to modify the code. Well, yeah. So so let me let me just give you like a live demo of this. Here. Yeah. So uh, so let's just say something simple like we have G one. X10, Y10, G1, X0, Y0, and maybe you have something in between, like G1, X2, So you're going y. to those values, yeah. Yep. Move. So, then I, I update this, and this gets, like, the maximum size of the board, so 10 by 10. And then I put in my heights here. So let's just say we've got something that's, like, a increasing slope. So we got 0, 0, 0, zero then 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2. And then I generate my G code, and so you can see here. So oh. at ten, bugger's point is at two, so it's interpolated at this. Oh, okay, two. okay. So it's just. Yeah, so okay, it's just, you already uh, have this, right? Right. So you, so you take the matrix. Um, so that so let's see, how do you do it? You do, you go to certain positions and you put those in in that height map, and this automatically outputs the correct G code. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So you got that already. Great. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's that's how that works. Okay. So you've got that correction. And that way we can do the correct G code and and uh, that G code you can actually put it into is. put into something like Marlin or something. Yeah, and they don't have to you don't have to deal with any of the Marlin's features and figuring out how to make that work with ours. Yeah. Right, and the mechanics are like if you so say the, so during the print, you're, you're actually moving the z-axis up and down, right? Like, Yeah, and, yeah your, your z is constantly following shifting. the contour yep. of whatever you're cutting. That's right, and that's what happens. Um, wait, but how do you, if you use Marlin, how do you, it depends on how that is implemented, right? Because in principle, all you're moving... Doesn't it depend on that? Because all you're moving is X, Y, and then the Z is kind of like independent. So if you're shifting the uh, Z. Sorry, my wife just came on. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, it's, yeah. Well, no, no. So Marlin, it's, it's still just sending your 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 output oh, yeah. code is a G1 command with X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So so your, your Z axis is just going to have small correction deflections essentially as it follows the contour of your board okay so say you but but look at look at the mechanics of marlin you upload a g-code file so so you're essentially saying oh, that you upload the g-code file and then you disable the calibration this disable correct. the battle yeah, you don't do it you don't do any leveling because that's now embedded in embedded in the g-code okay so that should work so what you do is then so I say I set this up, I, I start the print procedure using Marlin, and instead of putting that auto-leveling sequence, you just eliminate it from the startup code, and then you're just Correct. going. Uh, so that's that's the way we want to do it then? No problem. I, I think so, because that's, yeah. that's, that's how I understand it with my system. The, okay. The more, the more you can make it like my system, I think... The okay, let's just right let's work with yours. That's good enough. That's it works. So yeah, yeah, yeah let's do it. Um, um, let's see, and and what do the professional things do? Like say, well, like say, sh like Shea Poco when they, we should study what they do. I mean, how do they well, do that? Like, is is if, that a pain in the ass? Talk about like the really professional ones. Yeah. Uh, the really professional ones, 
uh, like the twenty thousand dollar ones that like Michigan Tech has. It has a vacuum table and it just sucks things down, and they don't have to do any leveling at all. Yeah, but initially you got to calibrate it. So how does it calibrate it initially? Uh, like they, it, it has like it's they they just level it, and then they zero at one point, and then the system's repeatable and, and zero enough because of the vacuum table that mm -hmm. they can just go to town. They don't have to calibrate it each time. Yeah, but at one time, that's, that's I mean, that's twenty thousand dollars gets you. Right, but at the same time, there's going to be one, you know, that you don't build it and then you've got a perfect machine. You build it and then you calibrate it, right? So they've got to do one calibration yeah. up front. Sure. So, right. Because in our system, like once we, I mean, if we have a reliable clampdown mechanism, then we should be just as good, right? Yeah, I mean. Once we have yeah, the calibration, it should be pretty so good. The, I say the video of me making my uh, my my clamping system, right? You ever seeing that? Uh, I right, actually, I'm not sure I remember. I, I, can, I, can just, I can just show it to you right now. Mm -hmm. It's really simple. Uh, so I have I have something that clamps on onto the I have clamps on the table, and then it clamps into this uh, piece of oh shit! Oh damn it! <laughs> there was dust, and now it's all on my keyboard. Anyway, um, so. Uh, so I have clamps that clamp down on this. Mm -hmm. This this surface was milled down flat by the same mill, um, and this this has a slot cut in it that's exactly the size of my material that mm -hmm. I'm cutting. Um, yeah. And then I just have these washers on there, and these washers uh, they I can clamp down without taking too much surface area uh, on on the board, so I don't have to. So I can utilize most of the material. So do you have to calibrate for every single board you do, or one? I, yeah, I still do because even when you put that in there, my boards they have like they they always have like a, a certain flex to them. And a vacuum table would get rid of that flex. Apparently it does. That's that's what I've been told. But what about variation in the thickness of the board? Right, you still have to account for that. I, I think they I think they also spend a lot for their uh, their piece boards of material. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Like I said, I, I think the more the more we keep this uh, familiar to what I've been doing, I think it might be better, and then we can kind of branch out from yep. there. Yep. Yep. This is our first first deal. Yeah. We'll do that, and then go from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sounds good. What else? Anything else? Uh, so uh, yeah, we I think we solved that. Yeah. Touch off calibration circuit. So yeah, you do that. Um, so manually just, just do that, like the clamps that you've done? Yeah, I think so. I, th I think okay. that, that'd be best to start off with. And I mean, so, so we've got a few spare days in the calendar. So, it, I mean, if it comes out to it, we can try some different things. Yeah. So... So maybe maybe one thing to put on the calendar is a look at look at automating automating level process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Like, if we get this thing working, then it's on to like how do we facilitate the calibration. Okay. Sounds good. Awesome. <sighs> Alright, I think I think we should quit here. It's been a long meeting. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Re really good. Um, good stuff. So yeah, yeah, so, yeah, we'll get ready for it. I'll work on the mechanical design uh, and sourcing of the parts and just decide on a spindle. Like if that's simple, you know, I'm kind of inclined if that very, very simple spindle works that we've already done. I'll take a look at that and evaluate if it meets our needs. Make sure it's yeah. got the longevity and stuff and we'll go from there. Alright. And do the mechanical um, and mm -hmm. Okay. Alright. Well I, Excellent I think, Shane. That's, so that's definitely good amount of stuff to work with.
Yeah, and just the only thing you have left over with Dr. Pierce is just make sure what his expectations are on um, on a working mill sure. with respect to yep. the lead screw versus belts. Yeah. Because right now we're pretty much planning on both. See if... Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I will talk to you later, Martian. All right. Uh, yeah, just, so if your CAD guys have any questions uh, for me, they, they can go, they can email me directly if they want. Yep. So that's fine. Okay, excellent. All right, Shane, thanks a lot. We'll talk soon. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, have a good one.